Okay, good evening. So tonight we're looking at the Dhammapada again. Today we look at verses 197 to 199. And they read as follows. Susukang Vattajivama Verinesu Averino Verinesu Manusesu Viharama Averino Susukang Vattajivama Aturesu Anatura Aturesu Manusesu Viharama Anatura Susukang Vattajivama Usukesu Anusuka Usukesu Manusesu Viharama Anusuka Which means Happily indeed we dwell Among the vengeful Unvengeful among vengeful humans, we dwell unvengeful. Happily indeed we live. Among the miserable, we are not miserable. Among the tormented, we are untormented. Among tormented humans, we dwell untormented. Happily indeed we live among the longing without longing, among those humans who long, and who yearn, we dwell un unyearning, uncraving. So these verses were taught in regards to another one of these well-known pop, pop culture, pop Buddhist, popular culture Buddhist stories. This is the story of the Buddha's relatives. They're the relatives on his mother's side, the Kolias, and the relatives on his father's side, the Sakyans. I think that's how it was. And they dwell together in relative harmony, neighbors. But they had between them this watershed. Watershed means a place where the water comes from. The natural part of land where water comes to feed the crops. And together they built a dam. And the dam sent water to both of the countries or nations, I guess, states. And in the hot season, there was a drought and the plants started to wilt. And so they said, well, now let's just take all the water for ourselves and you know, if the water comes to us, it'll be enough to feed our plants. And the other people said, yeah, right. And then, and then we'll come and buy crops from you. Now let's divert it to us and the, the water will come Anyway, the simple the, the text gives a very sort of simplistic uh, breakdown of the conversation that went on, basically saying, we'll take it all, no, we'll take it all. Um, which I take to mean probably it was a little more complex and they were, they couldn't agree on how to share the water. Greedy. And so they started fighting and they, they it came to blows apparently and they couldn't resolve things. And then the laborers got into it and they started bickering and saying nasty racist slurs actually um, because there are histories they have or the background story of the Sakyans is there's a story of how they <clears throat> they were so intent on their purity that they they committed incest they would they would have uh, relations with their relatives 
it was an ancient story. It was something in their mythology. And the Kolians had this this legend, something about living in the forest of the Jujub forest or something. And so they started saying, you know, oh, like we're really going to be afraid of these incestuous, these these men who sleep with their sisters. And the others say, oh, we're really going to be afraid of these lepers who lived in the Jujub forest. And so then they reported back these insults to their the ministers, and the ministers reported them back to the the royals, and the royals came out with weapons ready to go to war, saying, we'll show you how these men who sleep with their sisters can fight, and so on. And the Buddha became aware of this and thought to himself, well, it's quite clear that I have to get involved. These are his relatives. I've heard this used as a sort of example of how Buddhists should meddle in uh, politics. I actually had it given, cited as an example of how monks can and should follow the Buddha's example of getting involved in politics, but that's nothing to do with this. This is, that, this is not that sort of a case. This is the Buddha's relatives. So it may be a minor lesson. We can talk a little bit about the idea of helping your relatives. Is, is I think... A, it's a good place to start anyway, and it's a, because it's very close to home for a lot of people. It doesn't mean that you have a duty to. Um, but I think if your relatives come to blows, you, you might think that you have some kind of duty to at least see how you can intervene. There are other times where the Buddha tried to intervene with his relatives and, and it didn't work out and he gave up. So that's certainly well within one's rights. But the other thing is the Buddha had something course quite special about him and so he took his duties a little more seriously <clears throat> because of his capacity to influence people. At any rate he, he, he went to the river and he where they were fighting ready to turn the rivers to bloods the rivers to blood and the Buddha asked them what they're fighting over. He, he saw these warriors coming the, the soldier, the infantry soldier. You know. And he asked them, he said, what are you fighting over? I said, well, I don't know. And he said, well, maybe the commander knows. And so the Buddha, they brought him to the Buddha, and the Buddha said, what are you fighting over? And he said, water. And by this time, I guess the royals were there, and the, the leaders of the armies, and they were aware that the Buddha was in the middle of the battlefield. And they came to listen and the Buddha said, well, what's worth more water or nobles? Noble, katya, he said. And they said, well, water is actually quite worthless compared to the life of a noble human. And the Buddha said, indeed, here you're fighting over something worthless. You've, you've lost sight of what is truly worthwhile. And he said, you people who live in misery, you're nothing like us. We live in happiness. And then he taught these verses. So it's a simple story, but it's a memorable one. You hear about how the Buddha reminded them of what was worthwhile. And I think that's the first lesson. I, I think can think of three lessons from this story and these verses. The first lesson from this story, well, the, the little lesson that I said about family, I think there's not much that needs to be said there, but it's worth noting that to some extent we, we can arrange our lives based on our duties. And meditation isn't going to tell you explicitly how to, how to live your life because most of how we live our life is arbitrary. But there's a way of organizing this arbitrariness where you esteem your relatives. And it's not, it's not really uh, meaningless, but uh, you, you, you see that there's, a, there's an importance there because of the closeness and because of the, the sense of gratitude uh, for, for people who have done good things for you. But it can also be people who have done bad things towards you. 
So helping your relatives becomes a part of this structure of what we call, uh, well, life, I guess, um, society. You know, things like, like getting involved in politics. I think to some extent, if you're not a monk, it can be a part of your duty, but it comes down to organizing your whole life in society in terms of duties, obligations, what's right. Have some kind of a, a, a order to it where you say, oh, my family is fighting well. And as a relative, I have a duty. Now, meditation isn't going to show you that. It's going to show you the opposite, that really we're all related and we don't even exist. In the end, there's just experience. So helping your relatives is only a conventional thing. But conventions provide this order and stability. So I don't think it's a very deep lesson, but something for meditators to keep in mind. You might go out and feel lost. What do I do? And you don't connect with your family or your society. And to some extent, that's, that's proper. That's correct. Because none of it's really real. But on another level, it can be very useful and beneficial in so many ways for your meditation, for your livelihood, for your, your peace of mind to fall into an order of relatives and friends and society and culture and laws and politics even and, and so on. Not, not to take any of it too seriously, but to accept and understand and appreciate the order of it. Um, but the real lesson from the story, I think, is, the, is about what is worth, what has worth. It reminds us of the worth of human beings. Uh, the Buddha, I don't think there's any real um, backing to the idea that the Buddha valued nobles as more than, than uh, ordinary folk when he said this, but he was, of course, appealing to these royals' um, concepts and, and making them realize, oh yes, not only are we killing humans, but we're killing princes, kings. And, and that's such a waste. I mean, it's such a, if you look at, in terms of society, it's such a disruption for society. If you kill a, an ordinary foot soldier, it's disruptive to his family, to his friends, but not so much to society. I think the Buddha would recognize that there is a greater importance on a, on a in terms of the effect that they have on society. So killing a king, even potentially a bad king, is much more disruptive and problematic than killing a bad person or a good person, to some extent. So, but I think the, the bigger lesson here is the things we fight over are worth so much less than the people we fight with them over. When we fight with someone, we are able to forget, or we're not able, we, we come to forget their value, their importance, their greatness. It's not even exactly worth or value, it's their significance. And what is the significance of being hungry and having our crops fail and not being a prosperous nation? There's disruption there, but the significance of a human being, the human beings who, who um, benefit from, who are able to live and cultivate good, wholesome qualities because of those things you know, that we fight over. The humans are much more important. So I think a part of our practice on a conventional level is um, remembering the greatness of humans and, and appreciating I mean, it allows us to overcome petty differences and, and what we call vera, which means vengeance. You know, when people do bad things to us or are evil and we, we take them, we hold them up as, a, as the cause of our suffering, right? That's very wrong. It's very misguided. And it, it, it not only causes us to forget what's good in them, but it also creates greater evil, right? When we, when someone is evil to you and you're evil back, you're the worst person because you're causing the fight. When a person is angry, uh, mean even, it's the jo the duty, it's our duty to not respond. We are the ones who can create a, a, 
a, a battle, a war out of it. And so thinking about the worth of other beings and the potential importance, significance and power should make us very cautious and, and wary and, and um, disinclined to come into conflict with others. Mostly we should appreciate people and try to evoke and, and build and establish good qualities in ourselves and them in, in our societies. Remembering the value of humans. Of course, the, the greatest value is the value in, in meditation practice. Valuing others people's, other people's potential to become enlightened. Just in general, their ability to better themselves. Something we should never forget. Never be selfish or withhold the teaching from others. Withhold good thing, goodness or good advice from others. We should be able to see past our prejudices and differences. It's a good way, if nothing else, to work through problems we might have with others. The Buddha said that you should always think like a few monks. We go around picking up cloth from garbage. We have to put together our robes. The traditional way is to go and find cloth that people have thrown away and, and sew it together. But if you find a piece of discarded cloth, often part of it is moldy or, or rotten, and you can't use that part, so you have to cut it off, rip it apart, and take only the good part. And the Buddha said, this is like people. You should think of people this way. Everyone has, sometimes their speech is bad and their actions is bad, but maybe in their th thoughts are good, or maybe sometimes they say or do things that are wholesome. You should tear apart, the, tear off the rotten part, put it aside. Think only of the good. I mean, I don't think we should ignore evil in people. Obviously, the Buddha's not saying that. But when you're thinking of, when you're for your own um, quality of mind, your thoughts should be focused on building. Focus on building the good. So that's the lesson I think from the story. From the verses, it's basically the same verse three times. And even the verses are repetitious. It's basically saying, we live happy among those who are unhappy. And talking about why they are unhappy. So two lessons here. The first one falls in with this, and it's a very important lesson, falls in with the very important lesson of being happy independent of your situation. So I talk a lot about being happy regardless of your experiences, but this is a little bit different. It's talking about being happy in irrespective, regardless of um, the people around you, regardless of who's in your company. To some, I mean, it may also simply be saying that, well, everyone else in the world uh, is being, is, is, unhappy we we live happily so it may not be that you live with unhappy people but nonetheless it's it's pointing out this uh, capacity to live independent of the, the the vicissitudes or the the current no the stream of of society which gets caught up quite often in, in vengeance and manipulation and outright war often. Right? But it's, it's amazing living, living the way we do as monks. It's often amazing to hear about or even meet with situations where people are openly manipulative purposefully and of the mindset that it's right to manipulate. I remember, I guess, growing up that often that thought would come, yeah, the right thing is to get the better of someone else. I still know people who, who, who have those ideas. What is the right thing for me to do? It's to manipulate someone else, and so on. Fighting, you know, often the idea is if someone makes you angry, you should fight them physically or in court, right? 
we hear about divorce, something like it was something like 50% of marriages end in divorce or something very high now. And often it, it's quite uh, quite angry, quite violent, I guess. Fighting, arguing. I remember my parents divorcing was, was not very... Hmm, anyway. A lot of a lot of suffering because of it, and yet we we engage in this in society. So, being able to live peacefully, first of all, just being able to live peacefully, of course, is a very difficult thing. But it's made more difficult by our reactions to our experiences. But more, I think, even more significantly, our reactions to other people. The Buddha said we should surround ourselves with good people, of course, and and being among people who are enlightened or on the path to enlightenment is is essential. So it's the most important thing. But we have to also recognize that a part of why it's so important is because of how we react, how we take on, not just react, but take on the qualities of other people. If we're surrounded by angry people, we start to get angry ourselves. If we're surrounded by lustful, greedy people, we start to become greedy ourselves. If we're surrounded by deluded people, well, we follow their delusions, wrong views even. And, and that a part of our practice, one aspect of it, is becoming independent of this as well. Even here in the meditation center, it's easy to feed off of each other's emotions. But what's great is that we're all working and, and, and living in a way that is trying to over, overcome these qualities. And so our interactions are generally beneficial to each other, reminding each other of our, uh, our practice, of our goal, our, our direction. Mindfulness is... is Something um, is meant to provide this independence. So a part of the goal, a part of the the train, the the skill that we're that we're hoping to gain from this is the capacity to be independent, and that means independent of unhappy people, uh, un, unskillful people. And I think that's important to recognize. It's important to see how influential others are, how we depend often on their um, on on their approval, how we are manipulated by their desires, how we are controlled by arrogance and oppression and and our own conceits and so on. How deeply ingrained our reaction our reactions are to to other people. It's a part of how mindfulness changes us. Because ultimately it's not... See, it, 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 is, it, 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 it feels often like it's just natural. It's like a part of our biology. It's hardwired into us that when we're around other people, somehow magically we become like them. And, that reacting to other people is just a part of nature, a part of how the mind works. But mindfulness shows you that it's, again, a two-step process. You have the experience, and then you react to it. And they're two very different things. That a person cannot make us angry. A person cannot hurt us. They can provide us with experience, with stimulus. So a person shouts at us and says nasty things, Ultimately, it's just sound. It can never go beyond just sound until it comes into our mind and we uh, process it and then react to it. And so mindfulness works on this level and it, it actually provides you with something that may, may have seemed impossible, the capacity to live independent of other people's uh, judgments, opinions, or manipulations.
even other people's violence, physically, verbally, emotionally. So I think that's an important lesson. It, it provides us with some perspective on our mindfulness practice, how it relates even to our reactions to other people. And we should keep that in mind always when we're in touch with others. Even here, having some kind of sense that the other meditators are looking at you. You know when you sit together in a group in meditation, you often feel self-conscious. Even relating to the teacher, often you feel afraid of the teacher, or worried, afraid of failing and so on. All of that is, is a part of our practice, overcoming that. You should never react to anything the teacher says even. If the teacher were to say, which I hope I never do, oh, you're such a bad meditator, you really are terrible at this. You know, how that would affect you? And it shouldn't. Mindfulness should, the purpose of mindfulness is to break that connection. If someone says you're a terrible meditator, you should, oh, you, you should see it only as this person has said I'm a terrible meditator. That's it. It should not be oh yes, I'm a terrible meditator, feeling bad about it. That's such a bad thing that what that person says, or feeling angry towards them. All of this is, is a hindrance to your own enlightenment. I mean, just very, very simple examples. Of course, it becomes more complicated in the world. But that's, I think, the second lesson, our independence from other people and their emotions and their and our uh, reactions to their actions. The, the other lesson, not so much a lesson, but, but a, a teaching, because the Buddha mentions three different qualities, three different verses, almost exactly the same, he just changes the word, and so I think the other lesson is about these qualities. It's just a description of three qualities. And, and so I guess the lesson is when we say we're happy among those who are unhappy, what does it mean to be unhappy? What makes these people unhappy? How would you describe someone who is unhappy? And the Buddha gives three qualities. The first is vera, which means vengeance. They are vengeful. The second is uh, at, atura, which means misery. And the third is usuka, or usu. Usu, which means uh, longing, or lustful, or desiring, craving. And so these three, I, I think they're interesting because they are different. They may sound similar, but they actually are, are, describe three different qualities of what it means to be unhappy. Uh, so the first one, vengeful, this involves our violence towards each other, our anger and, and com the, the, the uh, antagonism we have towards each other. You know, when we work to hurt others or to manipulate them, to, to, um, to control or, or dominate other people, but mostly just fighting, right? Fighting is such a part of human life, it's a part of society. We might, in some cultures, in the culture I grew up with, arguing and fighting was just a big, I think in most cultures it's true, it's just a part of life. When, you, when you're kids you fight with your siblings, and when you're grown up you fight with your spouses, you fight with your friends, enemies. We have political fighting where people are shouting at each other and calling each other nasty names. Terribly unhappy. It, all, it ultimately, uh, the, in the ultimate, on the ultimate level, it, it's war. This is what leads to killing each other, torturing each other, inflicting pain on each other. Terribly unhappy. So an aspect, uh, the first aspect of unhappiness is our misery that we share with each other. We, we meet out uh, misery on others, and it's a very miserable sort of thing to do. It makes you uh, less 
pure and peaceful in your mind and it, it creates a scar on your, your psyche really and cultivates this habit of violence, this habit of meanness, evil and so it's not about yet about being unhappy yourself but it's about inflicting unhappiness on others and engaging in the cultivation of unhappiness which is by itself an incredible sort of unhappiness it's a very unhappy sort of way to live killing each other, hurting each other bickering with each other, fighting and so on The second one is, is misery, which I think you can say refers simply to suffering. But the commentary makes clear what are we talking about here. We're talking still about the suffering of defilements. What we call kilesa, which translates as defilements. And the point being here is that it's not our experiences, again, that cause us suffering. It's our states of mind, our reactions to them. When we dislike certain things, when we're partial to others, the misery of defilements, that's what the commentary says, it's the misery of our mind. So ir um, irrespective of our interactions with others, even sitting alone in your room, of course, you can be incredibly miserable. We can cultivate great hostility towards others or hatred of ourselves. We can develop paranoia and fear, depression, right? all these what we call mental illnesses, which really, uh, on a deeper level, have to be separated out in, in, in terms of experiences and our reactions to them. Even a schizophrenic, and I keep going back to schizophrenia, I don't, I, again, I don't have much experience with them, but it sounds like it, there's a very clear difference between the physical, the, the experiences of schizophrenia and the reactions, the paranoia and the fear and the depression and anger and whatever comes from those experiences. Not to say it's easy or trivial, but well, with things like depression or phobia, it's certainly a lot simpler. Anxiety, people who have uh, panic attacks, it's much simpler. It's much simpler than we think to deal with it, but it requires um, a lot of work. It's not easier. It's not easy by any means. But people are miserable because they get caught up in experiences and reactions and they cultivate reactivity, which we call defilements. Their minds are not pure. And it simply means that their minds are not capable of being peaceful. Their minds are not strong. Their minds are not coherent, right? mixed up. When you first come here, you feel, start to meditate, oh, you feel very mixed up. But as you practice, you start to feel some of this orderliness, this peacefulness that comes from an orderly, pure mind. Sometimes. Well, more and more as you practice, of course. And the third quality is uh, longing. And again, very, very, it's very distinct. Longing in many cases appears to be pleasant, appears to be happy. And, and this is mainly because, well, it, it can be associated with pleasant feelings, but it's mainly because the object, the thing that we're holding up, right, the, the object in, of our emotion, the longing, we long for something, that thing that we long for is a pleasant thing. There's happiness in that to some extent. So if you long for good food, it's because the experience of eating good food has a, has a pleasant feeling associated with it. And so when you're longing for something, there's a, you're, you're mistaking the longing for the pleasure. Right? And so it, it's, very, um, it's very deceiving because you live your life, we live our life longing, thinking that we're happy or not even so much thinking that we're happy, but conceiving that we're happy, and, and not, not realizing how unhappy it all is. But there's an incredible unhappiness involved with longing, craving, striving for moments of pleasure, 
how much uh, craving goes into good food and then the, you have a moment or two of pleasure and then it's gone. And what you're left with is not happiness. What you're left with is desire for more, of course, longing, dissatisfaction. What you see through meditation is that we haven't built up happiness through our pleasure seeking. We've only built up more addiction and longing. It's part of why it's quite stressful to simply sit and be is because of our longing, because of our craving, because we want so many things. It's a very stressful, painful part of, of our psyche, part of our humanity. And so I think these three qualities provide a good description of what we're working to overcome, to root out, to free ourselves from, to free ourselves from vengeance, from anger and hatred towards others, to free ourselves from the defilements of our mind, the suffering, the torture that we put ourselves through, and to free ourselves from longing for something to make us happy something to make us happy, no? Susukang Vata Jivama We dwell happy when we free ourselves from these three, three things. Even when we're surrounded by other people who are unhappy. I think it's a part of what you start to see through the practice, how unhappy people are because of their cravings, because of their hatred, because of their delusion. So, that's the Dhammapada for tonight. Thank you all for listening. So.